Hello, hi, KD. I'm very good. Good. My contract. <laughs> right on track. Okay. Silence. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So it's 9 a.m. again on a Sunday night. It's raining over here. I don't know on that side in KB. Oh. How is it right now in KB? Um, KB is quite sunny uh, the whole day. And then I thought that uh, today is like the best weather in this um supposed to be monsoon season but you know the the season has keeps on changing now so um yeah we just had like a little bit cloudy afternoon and then the rest are all fine oh okay so i guess yeah. i brought the rain back with me should be <laughs> <laughs> yeah rain heavily okay guys anyway we're back um again on the um golden exchange hour uh, we have this uh, every Sunday, 9 a.m., and it's alternate between a Malay and an English version. So tonight is the English version again. And tonight, instead of interviewing our Mr. President, I'll be co-hosting with him. Yes, <laughs> tonight I'm not the president of Malaysian Craft Council, but we were, <laughs> what we're going to share tonight uh, in this Golden Exchange Hour, as always, is about the topics that I was saying to um to Katie before it's something casual and then we just want to let people to listen to something that we want to highlight to that tonight and of course tonight's topic is very much exciting it's about the importance of knowing and honoring your heritage and we brought in here the best uh, panel I, I that I can think of somebody who is dear to me and who have been dealing with this kind of business for a long time and why do we choose this topic Katie? Okay, why we chose this topic is because it's actually a topic suggested by John himself um, uh, after I attended, you know, right after the, the content exchange. Yeah, so straight back to KL and then um, I, I was fortunate, um, I got the opportunity to attend John's talk on um, that Wednesday during mm -hmm. luncheon, a luncheon, so I was invited for his talk, so alhamdulillah, and I was so inspired uh, by his uh, talk and one line hi john hi john <laughs> so john said this you know he said malays you guys should be confident and should be very secure of your heritage and oh my god you know? so is I was this... so inspired by that i thought exactly and john is not even a malay okay john and that's what you were saying katie but i thought it's like a slap in the face <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it is a slap. In a way, it is a slap. But again, on another side, it is. Uh, this is what I've been advocating with the students. You know, at school, I've been like, "Come on, man! It's like wake up." It was that I. I it's sad to say because I think Nick, um, there's also Malays who don't want to admit that they're Malays. Yeah, so I believe that this Malaysian yeah. Craft Council, one of our main core items to to think of or to to to. Uh, I mean, the vision that we are looking at is towards empowering our heritage and then get yeah. it going and and let people to keep talking about it and then knowing our heritage and our history and ourselves actually because yeah. that is the only way for us to to know about our ancestors and the thing that happened in the past and then you know be, without the past we will never be here and then there will never be future so yeah. i guess now is a good time for us to let it to keep it going and then to let John himself to talk about yes. what is it? So why is it very right? important to know yes. and honor your own heritage? Yeah. So John, welcome to tonight's Golden Exchange Hour. It's a very chill, chill session. So, yes. you know, we're, we're just uh, sharing exchange and we love to hear your thoughts on that tonight. Uh, the fact that you're, it's a different perspective from somebody in a way, um, not a Malay, you know, and, and yet you're so passionate about our roots, the Malay world itself. So yeah, go ahead. The floor's yours, John. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, and I feel very privileged and honored to be on this uh, board. Um, well, you know, the reason why I came to Malaysia, do, do you know? <laughs> I do, but I'm sure the, the viewers would like to know. <laughs> Why, why do you think I came to Malaysia? The grab price. The grab, who says it's because of grab? Yes, one of the reasons was I was sitting on the grab, right? And then, you know, I had no idea grab price would go up in price like it's now, right? <laughs> but at that time, I looked at the price. It was like 18 ringgit from, um, you know, from the KLCC to the Selangor Golf Club. And I said, 
and the car is still driving. It's only 18 ringgit. 18 ringgit, you know, you divide it. It's like $6 sing. In Singapore, it's like 18 ringgit Singapore it will cost. Yeah. And in Taiwan, maybe it will cost 20, you know, it will cost 30 ringgit. So I'm saying, look, it's so cheap. I wonder what it's like to live here, right? So I, I had tea with my friend at Selangor Golf Club and he said, why don't you check out the housing? <laughs> and when I checked it out, I said, oh my God, my small teeny apartment in, in Malaysia would buy me a mansion here. And it did, you know. <laughs> but, you know, the main reason I, I think I moved here was because I decided to devote my life to the study of Malay culture through its textiles. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, my, it, it's like, Fate changes in your life. You know, as you go through life, you have different purposes. So when I was in Taiwan, I was very excited because I was studying Chinese culture. Yes. And I was bringing, bringing into Taiwan my own view of what Chinese culture is, which was very refreshing to the Taiwanese because I had a very Western viewpoint of Chinese culture, but it wasn't just Western. It was also my own viewpoint. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and, and to them, it was new. So when I started my gallery, I was showing antique Chinese art in very contemporary spaces, which was very new to them. They would show antique Chinese art in antique spaces. Okay. You know what I mean? So it was things like that. And then later I brought in yoga, which was different from the yoga that the Taiwanese were teaching because they were like, only women could do yoga and only women that have, you know, this nylon tights and they had to cover themselves completely. And here I was, you know, teaching yoga in mini shorts with earrings and diamonds all over myself. So it was very new to them. So maybe in Malaysia, you know, but then my interest in things Chinese change. And slowly my interest, it, it changed because I was, you know, promoting Chinese furniture. It became so expensive that it was impossible to buy. It, and the people whom I dealt with, the crowd, the, the clientele whom I dealt with actually also changed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I love mm -hmm. Taiwan. I have nothing to complain about it. I mean, I mean, it's, it's a wonderful country. The people are wonderful, very warm. But I found the people in Malaysia just as warm and wonderful. And of course, mm -hmm. like Taiwan, the food here, you know, one thing in life is food, right? And uh, you can yeah. see how I enjoy the food in Kelantan. Oh, um, yeah. So, <laughs> food, food is very important to me. So, Malaysia had both the people and the food, right? And then, of course, for my main purpose is the arts, right? It had all the arts here that Taiwan didn't have. In fact, it's, I shouldn't say that because Taiwan at that time was already beginning to be interested in Malay arts. So then the southern branch of the National Museum is collecting a lot of things from Malaysia, mm. which uh, is not happening in, I mean, you, you're, Malaysians are not collecting mm. things from Taiwan. It's, yeah. it's yeah. different. It's, it's, True. Taiwan in that way is more advanced, but besides the museum, no one else was interested. So I, mm. I kind of was very lonely there in terms of my collecting of Malaysian text, Malay textiles. So I decided, you know, since I'm giving up my life to study Malay culture and textiles, you know, uh, mm. for good, it's my main mission in life. I must as well move here. And then mm. everything started to click. The house came in, you know, I, I got a lovely place and uh, I made, I made, so many friends within the first year. I had my exhibition in Trenganu the second year. Mm -hmm. you know, and then this thing happened in Kelantan, which was so exciting. And now I'm having my own big exhibition next year, right? Yeah, uh, I'm so right. excited for that. Yeah, and it will coincide. I heard it might coincide with um, the, the hosting of the main Southeast Asian Textile Symposium. So all the the textile collectors from the whole of Southeast Asia will be uh -huh. here during my exhibition, which is wonderful. Right. Yeah, that'll be somewhere uh, in July, John. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's the the date, but uh, it might be that the same period. Just a second, let me put on the fan. Okay. okay. So I believe that with the period of July next year, okay. or maybe it will be you know plus minus because I think yeah. we but by now we have to be adaptive to the situation where we yes. don't know what will happen and then what yeah. has happened. So I am so excited to, to listen to John's um, opinion about this uh, food, people, and art. So 
And then uh, when, when you say that uh, Taiwanese are actually collecting Malay artifacts where we do not really appreciate our own artifacts. And then we were discussing before uh, with a few friends saying that, oh, okay, my, my grandma has this song cat and, yeah. and it's really heavy, but we don't even keen to, you know, keep it um, to be in our lineage and everything. So I believe there must be something very, very important why oh. artifacts which we might not even know. So what is that about, John? I think what's missing here is um, the correct direction in education. Yeah. There's very good education in Malaysia. Exactly. The direction is probably going in the wrong way. Exactly. Uh, because, you know, in the past, we looked up to the West because the West had the best scientists. They were very advanced in the economy. But now the whole situation is changing. It's coming back to Asia, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, the, the difference between the West and Asia, right? Um, the West is very concerned ab about how the rest of the world um, respond, responds to them, right? Um, if the West does something wrong, they, they are afraid that the world will condemn them. But nowadays... Asia, when they do something, they are not afraid of what the rest of the world says because Asia is now in control and in power. Mm, you know, mm, the mm. richest people are all in Asia, yeah. especially China, right? So if China does anything, they don't care what people say. First yeah. of all, they are so confident about themselves. They have 4,000 years, I'm yeah. sorry, 5,000 years 5, of history, yeah. right? And they're very confident about history, their history because they have so many researchers and yeah. they have, you know, they have amazing museums that, you know, the textile museum, for example, the moment you enter, you see batik that's 4,000 years old. My God, you know, yeah. what's there not to be proud about, right? Yeah. And uh, they're so proud and so confident with their own culture, right? Like yeah. you talk to a lot of Chinese, young Chinese today, right? Like a lot of my friends who are in their 20s. They speak three to four languages. Most of my Chinese friends can speak French besides speaking to me in English, right? And mm -hmm. they've been around the world. They're so confident at their, of their own culture and they know their history by the back of their hands, right? Yeah. So they're well-educated. They, they know themselves. So nobody can tell them what, what to do. Exactly. Whenever they want, they will do what they want, right? Mm -hmm. So they are in control. And I think in Malaysia, we haven't realized that... We are there even though we are. Yeah. Yes, exactly. True, exactly. You're we right. are on top of the world, but yeah. we still look up to the West. Yes, we still yes. look at Western things. Yeah, you know, yeah. The education is showing us everything Western, whereas we should look back at what people like Mubin Shepherd told us to do years ago. Mubin Shepherd saw, you know, he is a foreigner, but he saw the high level of culture that the Malay people had. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I got so why was a Westerner writing about it? You know, mm. why wasn't he writing about his own English culture? Because mm. he saw that it was several centuries earlier than the British culture, right? True. It's yes. much older. You know, it just happened that we had a setback in 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 the nineteenth, eighteenth, uh, and nineteenth century, and then the 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 colonial um yeah. uh, people took over. Colon colonization took over. Correct. So that was. Uh, one sack back and then after 200 years we bounce back up it's like the dragon comes out of the sea again you know yeah yeah you're so right, right. this is the time we should reinvest in our own culture and be accustomed to it with confidence read more the school should be educating more in different aspects and not to put aside other cultures that have helped uh, Malay culture developed. For example, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, in the old days, right, Persian culture was so important to the Malay culture. Yeah. A lot of Persian words like Shabanda, Shah, you know, even the days of the week are all Persian, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, even Laksa. You know, Laksa is a Persian word for noodles. Did you know I that? See. Yeah. So no, I know that. Yeah. It, it, all it, these things we don't know, but you know, it's not just the language, for example, you know, when the kings wanted to have just rule, the Malay kings, they looked at Bustan al-Salatin and Taj al-Salatin. They are Malay works, but influenced by the Persians. The style of writing is Persian, right? So we know that 
we we respect the Persians and and then we we did our own version of of the text. The Malays did their own version of the text. So yeah. you know, it's it's when you see that you can see, hey, look, we are Malays and part of our culture is very adaptive. Yeah, we can yeah. adapt and then yes. we can recreate. Our yeah. own, even though we've been influenced by others, we don't copy hundred yeah. percent the 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 foreign uh, uh, ideas and concepts and de and designs and art. We see what inspires us, and then we use it to create our own, right? So even though we get a lot of textile designs from India, right? Mm. But the Malay textiles still don't look Indian. You know, we have made the Pacha Robong even bigger, more dramatic, right? Mm -hmm. We've claimed it to become our own textiles our own Malay textiles as opposed to India, even though some of the basic designs like Telo Barantai comes from India. Mm -hmm. Our Telo Barantai still looks different from the Indian Telo Barantai. And even, Correct. you know, but when the Malays realize this, for example, if they read, you know, how many Malays yeah. even heard of Sajara Melayu? Mm -hmm. right? But when you read about Sajara Melayu, you know that Hang Nadim, you know, when he was asked by the Sultan of Malacca to mm -hmm. go to Kling, which is in South India, mm -hmm to buy you know 40 types of cloth with each uh, type of cloth with 40 patterns um hang nadim went and asked them for the cloth and then they, when they showed them the cloth he says no 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 yeah. you need, you, need ta, ta bole. you know you cannot use this type that the, the sultan won't like it then mm -hmm. they said uh what kind of pattern do you like then he said i want this kind and this kind and this kind of pattern then they they told hang nadim why don't you design it for us so in the end, the Indians made the Malay cloth according to the Malay designs. Mm -hmm. It's Indian cloth, but the designs were Malay. So Malay. the Malays were always confident about their own uh, inherent level of creativity mm. and their own taste. They knew what they wanted. Yeah. Right? But now when you ask the Malays, right, they are so not confident. Yeah. They, they are so hesitant about stating what they really want. Exactly. I mean, you yeah, artists right. know what you're they want, right. Right? Mm -hmm. but in general, the general populace are not confident. And when you say anything about Malay culture, they become defensive, like, like you're yeah. attacking them, right? But it's not, they, they should be so confident, but they're not because the education hasn't shown them yeah. the, the full splendor of their culture. Yeah. The, the greatness of... Um... The Malay heritage itself. Right. They only know what I say, A, B, C, D. Yeah. E, F, G to Z, they are not familiar with. Yeah. True. You're right. You're right. They know, right? Nobody yeah. can take over them. No Westerner. They know they have, you know, uh, and a, a lot of them think that Malay culture started from Malacca, right? No, it started <laughs> oh. from, from Lanka Sukha, second century. Yeah. 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 So Malays have 2,000 years of culture and history. You know, some Malays even think it started from Sri Vijaya, Palembang, which is 7th century. Uh, uh, uh. No, it started from Lanka Sukha and Champa. Champa and Lanka Sukha were 2nd century. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. both of them had a lot to do with Malay culture. In fact, if you go around Kelantan, right, there's so much Champa culture there. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And that culture came very early on, right? Yeah. So I guess you, you realize that you too missed out on this education, right? Yeah, in ways. exactly. In a way, yes. In I a guess, way, yes. Mm. Yeah, I guess this is the thing about um, it's like a hidden strength that most Malaysian or most Malays don't even know that they have. And then, uh, you know, from the system, hidden weapon, <laughs> <laughs> the education system that we receive, those are actually like I, I don't know whether uh, uh, maybe John can say if it is manipulated to follow the method of what. Westerners or, 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 or a certain group of people would want it to be like, you know, Malaysia comes from uh, originated from Malacca and everything. And then I will also like to, sh to share about the other um, uh, perspective in Batik, because uh, I think everyone knows that I am in Batik or maybe some people know about that. I, I was informed that Batik originated in 1900, 1926 or 27 to be specific from Java, whereas we have from the Datuk Najib Dawa saying that Batik came to Malaysia even in 1800. So the history went way back. 
200 years in, instead of 100 years before. So maybe these are the things that certain group of people want it to be that way and then it's originated from Indonesia whereas we receive party from even Gujarat and John yeah. can tell about that when we yeah, yeah. when we talk about the when we uh, analyze party as the resist element and that came from the kind pelangi and whatnot so these are the things that I believe we have not discovered enough and then we just take it as is and then not much of the research done upon that so what what do you think about that, John? Is that something that certain group of people want it to be that way, or we have we have you know we don't even have enough documentation and research about our history? I think in that case, it's it's a matter of uh, definition. Okay, what batik is. Mm -hmm. So in the old days, the word batik was not completely um, described. Uh, described. Okay, today, when you talk about batik, it has to have a resist. Yeah. yeah. So it could be either soya paste resist or, 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 or wax resist or, yeah. or rice paste resist. Whatever resist you do is batik. Yeah. Okay, that means you put the resist on the cloth, you dye the cloth blue. So the resistant area is white. Yeah. It's a batik. Then you can put a color on the white. You can dye it again, or you can add paint on it. Okay, so that's batik. But that conception of what batik is only came around the beginning of the 20th century or the end of the 19th century. Yeah. Right? But in the earlier days, any printed of a, a, a cloth was considered batik. So batik kada, which started as you said in the 19th century was all made of woodblock prints directly onto the cloth without the wax yeah. and batik riau and batik siap was the same in siap in riau and batik songkla batik ligor batik narati wat patani kelantan was all done with block prints this and now and and we don't consider it batik that's why we say batik started in 1920 so once you realize this, you realize that um, the art of printing, whether it's by wax or by woodblock, started earlier on, mm -hmm. maybe 200 year history in this region, or maybe earlier. Mm -hmm. We don't know because mm -hmm. we don't, we haven't carbon 14 the woodblocks yet. Mm -hmm. Maybe some woodblocks may date to 300 years old, we don't know. But we know that in the museums in Songkla, mm -hmm. which is in South Thailand, in uh in the museum in um uh Chahaya Lingam in in Riau Linga, mm -hmm. they have all wood blocks, mm. and they have some batiks that are made of wood block, and then you have the batik kada, uh, which is very strange because they call it batik kada, but kada doesn't make batik or block prints. All the blocks come from Tringanu. Yeah. So probably it's called Batik Kada because they were like the biggest buyers of Batik Tringanu. But they were printed, right? So um, I think if people get to know this, then they, they are more confident that their culture of printed cloth started earlier. Mm. Yeah. It's, not, it's not 1920s. 1920s is when the copper blocks came in. Yes. With the wax, yeah. So it's very interesting to know about the history of our community, uh, history of us that, I mean, uh, talking from John's perspective as you are the expert in textile. So from textile alone, we get to uh, to bring out a lot of uh, stories stories about of our the past. Mm -hmm. but it, it's not just textiles, for example, Kelantan gold, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very few Malays know that Kelantan was the only place in the world that could do the finest gold granulations. You you know? wow. What they do is they take the gold foil and they put it in a crucible and then with sand. And then they shake it, right? Uh, and then the gold kind of, um, not with sand, it's, it's just a crucible with golden pallets, right? And then they shake it and then mm -hmm. it kind of forms its own little pallets and then they, they, they take it out and then they will um, separate the, the big ones from the small ones according to size. And then they create a certain formula where they heat these little granules 
they heat the you know the doko right that has all these granules they heat it to a, to a certain point where the granule will have a substance that, that will lower its melting point but the gold won't melt and then they will attach it to the doko which also has this uh, substance that will lower, lower the melting point but they'll control the heat so well that will stick and then when they put all these granules it's so consistent the 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 division in between each of these granules are exactly the same so it's a lot of concentration a lot of work and they created such beautiful jewelry you don't see this anymore and nobody can do it the chinese couldn't do it uh, i heard now there's only one lady in canada that's able to do this type of granulation i think the indians did it once but after that no one was able to do it so you know it's something that the malays should be proud of and should try to revive and the, the only problem now is the handphone, right? The, and Zooms and the internet and all these yeah. things. It's very hard to have the type of concentration yeah. that, we, we, that, that was available to people in those days. For example, uh, Lima Basongkit, right? Mm, How are you going yeah, to concentrate exactly. so well that you can get the gold threads directly over the Lima pattern? For yeah. example, the calyx of the flowers in gold, right? You want to weave that gold on your lima but at the same time you're weaving your lima to get the pattern of the flower out you need to think of the gold right on top of the flower so that's why it's it's a, a it, it's an art that's dying there's only two people in in uh in east coast in, in tringanu that can do it right one adi guru and then wang manang and then no one else can do uh lima basongkit so that's why i put it in a different category in my talk right because right, yeah. it, it's one technique that you know, people can do Lima, people can do Songket, but okay. Lima but Songket requires additional That's skill right. and concentration and focus. Yeah. How do we bring that, yeah. that back, right? So mm -hmm. I, I think there's still hope because now in this new age, right, people are recommending rem meditation and more and more people are yes. just into My meditation. mindfulness. Yeah. So when you get into meditation, you get in from, from the alpha to the beta to the de de delta mode, delta. right? Your mind starts to clear more and more. Your focus Correct. starts to sharpen more and more. And it's only then that you can achieve such a uh, yes, uh, yes. high level of art and craftsmanship. Correct. There you go. Since talking yeah. just about the heritage, we are now coming into metaphysics. Yes. Yeah, it is, and that it should is, be taught in schools. It, it should be you taught. Know? I agree. It should I be taught in schools. I agree. Because you know, Mindfulness is not um, taught in school right now in Malaysia. I think it's a very big emphasis in Indonesia, yeah. um, John, right? Um, Can you imagine how many suicides it will stop exactly. during the pandemic if the schools had taught mindfulness? Yeah. 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 You know how many schizophrenic, bipolar people, uh, yes, people yes, who are yes. wanting to do suicides and all that yes. because of the lack of mindfulness? Correct, correct. Mm. So yeah. mental health is not taught in schools. True. Um, and boy, did we all need it, right? <laughs> During yeah, the pandemic, all, I was so depressed. Yeah. I was so depressed in so many, I was crying and then was, oh, it was horrible. But I, good thing I had some, you know, I had some yoga training that kept me in, 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 in touch with the rest of the yeah. world. Nice. So, interesting. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. It, it is, it's very interesting. I, I love the fact that you know, John does yoga. So I think that's why you have that understanding and that um, refinement you know, to, to really feel. Um, because you see the difference between the West and the East on our side. I think we were very much um, heart centered. The West is all very much you know, system and um, steps, if you notice. But, but for us, right, the, the, from our side, we're very much, everything is from the heart. You know, when you produce, yeah. like John said, you know, the, mastery, the mastery that you need is beyond steps. It's beyond system. Yeah. It's very much, you know. Correct. So a lot of the mindfulness in the West now is turning to the East. Yep. Because the East were the masters of mindfulness. Mm -hmm. And they have so, a lot of Like meditation and Zen. Yeah. You know, and, and, and uh, you know, all these things, uh, they're turning to the Indian gurus, they're turning to the Japanese monks uh, for advice. Yeah. So, you know, like yoga came from India, right? So, yeah. um, you know, you know even, even to this day, right? I, I went to um, a talk by Ma Anku, um, oh. Raja Fauzia, and, and she 
spoke of you know the family doctor with high respect and the family doctor didn't use um western medicine he used yeah. herbs and things like that right yeah. to to right. cure her family member right and 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 also prayers and chants yeah. that, that we we neglect using nowadays yeah. you know when when you know i have two types of friends one type you know i tell them i pray for them regularly and they're very touched Another type of friends, I tell them that I pray regularly. They don't think much about it because they don't believe in the prayers, and yeah. you know they don't think that that's that important. But um, I think it's an important thing in in everybody's life because yeah. Um, uh, one thing that prayer does is takes, especially when you pray for uh for others and you give thanks, it takes your attention from yourself. You're right. Yeah. That's so true. And I think That's so true. when you do that, your art also becomes different. Yeah. When your art is not about yourself, but yeah. the, your art is about your community. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. You produce art for the sanity of your, your community and in the end, it's also for yourself. But yeah. it, right. it, it's thinking of it on a bigger scope, right? So I'm sure, uh, um, uh, Nick, uh, you understand this because you're doing the batiks not for yourself, Yes. But for the betterment of the artistic um, level uh, of batik making in your country. Right? Yeah. And then not um, to forget the community that we are serving. Yes, yes. Yeah. So that's what prayers are good for. You know, it opens yeah. your mind to others. And then I think it's a good thing for artists to always pray. You know, yeah. especially, Definitely. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's interesting that from, uh, the problem from fabric it goes to prayer. Um, if I is, remember the video you shared earlier. Earlier, uh, John, if I sh shared a video on Mat Yong. So yeah. this lady was sharing the art of Mat Yong, you know, and she was saying that you know Mat Yong is um, is about telling stories of the unseen, and yeah. in a way, it's like you're now telling stories of what of the unseen, you know, what happened in the past through those um, text through textiles, through Malay textiles, and it's textiles, a very a very, yeah. yeah, it's a very mystical and metaphysical world. You yeah. couldn't, and maybe that's why the world got disconnected because we fail to reconnect ourselves to the unseen world. So yeah. it's like the soul. Uh, there's something that soul needs more than what you know yeah. the physical needs. And mm -hmm. I would like to also share one point um, shared during the uh, exchange talk uh, in the Kelantan Exchange Art in the Perspective of Islam. When uh, this one panel was saying that when uh, in the past, when people mm -hmm. are doing the carving, the wood carving, yeah. they are actually meditating, and yes. and they are actually, uh, you know, uh, it's like a mantra that they they do salawat. Exactly. And yeah. yeah. Everything has a zikr yeah. with it. Yeah. 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 You're right. So that is mm -hmm. what makes the artwork um, yeah. a, a masterpiece. Because yes, yes. you know you don't really rush on time. You don't really yeah. you don't really say okay this has to be done within this period of time. But yes. you're actually doing it purely with your heart. True. Yeah. It's the same in in Kashmir, right? When you go to Kashmir and you see the men weaving the kani shawls, right? So every color has a different shuttle, right? So when you do the tapestry weave of the kani shawl, like if there are, there are you know two hundred colors, you have two hundred shuttles. And how do you remember which shuttle to use when they use a ballad? Mm. So when the song changes, the, the verse changes, the color changes. Mm. So they go with the ballad. So the song creates the textile. Isn't that interesting? It's, it's like very the carving in Kelantan, yeah, right? Yeah, it's very interesting. So yeah. in the old days, they knew how to utilize all their inherent, inherent abilities to create a, an artwork. I and, love that word, the inherent abilities. And you know what, what Nick talked about the soul, right? Mm. You know, when you ask, like when I was in Taiwan, right? I would go to my friend's house and I would actually count how many things in their house have a soul. Mm. <laughs> and, and, you know, I have some friends where everything in their house has a soul and some friends where everything in their house has no soul. Soulless. Soulless. Yeah. And... You know, I only noticed this um, when I, you know, when I first went to Taiwan, I started working in a tea house. And the tea house trained their staff to be soulful people. So when I went to the homes of the employees of the tea house, everything they had 
in their house had a soul. You know, in, in, they were not rich, right? They were poor. So their house had shelves, had broken branches, but there were beautiful branches, had rags that were picked up, but were turned into works of art by hanging on the wall. I was so touched. Everything that I saw vibrated with life. They had a kahitupan in it, you know? Yeah, yeah. You know? And then I go to my rich friend's house and I see a crystal from a Saraski crystal, uh, you know, and then I see a dog from Gucci and I see all these branded goods and they all look dead to me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's like, there's no life because there's no story, real yeah. story to tell, you know? Mm. Whereas my, my friends who collect these things, you know, you could see this. They, they, they collected it because they saw in it a rhythm of nature. They saw in it an essence of beauty. They saw in it something that touched their heart. And because those things had soul, right? And they, they bought it because, not because people told them that they were valuable or good, but yeah. because their own inherent appreciation of beauty connected them with, with it. All of us, you know, some people say, oh, you know, John, we were not born artists. We we're not like you, so artistic. I said, no, it's not because you're artistic. Everybody has a sense of artistic appreciation. It's in you. It's just that you're not told it's in you. You didn't bring it out. Yeah. That's, that's the other thing education should do. It should bring out the inherent uh, qualities of a human being. And one of the inherent qualities of humans is the appreciation of art or yeah. the appreciation of things that have soul. Yeah. Right? Exactly. So, so I was very hurt once when my, my friend said, John, why you pick up dead leaves? Just throw it away. It's useless. <laughs> no, it's, it, it, it's a beautiful sculpture in my house now, right? And it's free. Yeah. What more can you want? You know, free art. You know, and, and people who think that art has to be costly, yeah. I think, of course, yeah. good art, sometimes you have to pay a lot, right? Yeah. But art, beautiful things can also be free. And they, like good art, also have a soul, yeah. right? But how do you identify the soul? You have to have the soul yourself. Yeah. And how do you have the soul? Okay, you know the artist Hans Art, right? The, the French artist who created these, uh, what you call, concreations, uh, abstract pieces that look like Brancusi stone carvings. Mm -hmm. um, they are stone, but they look like they're twisting and turning and they're alive, right? Mm -hmm. But he didn't, he had a problem creating that because before that, he was stuck. He couldn't produce art. He felt that he came like to uh, an artistic block, like a writer's block. Then he realized that he was in Paris. He was too involved with the society and the stress and all that. So he decided to go to Switzerland to go up to the Alps and relax and let nature take over. And then when he connected with nature, his soul was revived. And when he went back to Paris, all these things started being created, right? So I'm sure, Nick, by going back to Kelantan, this happened to you too, where yeah. when, you, when you go back and you see all the flowers, you know, when you, I was so happy to see all that flower and plants. All these plants, you know, I went to my friend's house and she met, yeah, and she had kaladi leaves of every color. I was so excited. You know, yeah. and some people don't understand why I'm excited about those things because those things are the things that tick our souls and make us alive. And then when we revive our souls, then we can see the soul in other works of art. So exactly. how do you revive your soul? Education. Yeah. So yeah. education in the schools is not going to happen. And it won't happen in a long time, yeah. even if we tell the government now. Yeah. So it has to start from ourselves. You tell your kids, you know, my friends in Taiwan refuse to let their kids go to school. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. You know, yeah. where do they put their kids? In the forest, in the farms. They put their kids in the farms because they feel that the kids, if they do farming, they will be in touch with nature. They put their kids in tea farms, right? Because in tea farms, it's only when the worms bite the tea leaves that the tea leaves 
open up their pores and the flavor becomes wonderful. You know, it's, it's like the, they are so in touch with nature. You can only pluck the tea leaves at a certain time in the, like three or four in the morning when you pluck your tea leaves is when the tea leaves give up its best flavor. So you have to be in touch with the seasons and the time and the rhythms of nature so that when you drink the tea, you can feel the soul of the tea, right? Mm, so they yeah. put their kids on the tea farm instead of putting them to that's, school. That's How wonderful amazing. can that be, you know? Yeah. yeah. So now their kids are like uh, 20, 20 and 21. They know how to paint. They know how to drink wine. They know how to do a lot of things that most kids who go to school don't know. And the most important, they know how to make their own decisions. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's so important. We have to take a role in educating the youngsters by opening seminars, yeah. everything outside the school. Yes. Right? yes. Yeah. Seminars, exhibitions, yeah. um, talks, uh, you know, uh, master classes. Yes. Uh, it will be great if you know, like, if Nick, you know, continues all his master classes until he's ninety years old. You'll be still teaching the kids in Kelantan how to do batik. Yeah, you know, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it'll be wonderful, right? Yeah, you have to take the role. I think. Yes, you have to because it's one of our core values, John. One of the MCC core values. Yeah. Is it's a second pillar, I think. Um, if I use, right? Yeah, it's on education. Mm -hmm. that yeah, it's we on are, education. We need to look up on that. And then, oh my God, it was a very amazing insights that John just mentioned. And then I just want to take like, five minutes to share about my point of view about that. Because as John was saying, you know, rhythm of nature, we definitely need to do that. I was in Kuala Lumpur for 18 years before I decided to go back to Kelantan and then I don't know, um, it was 2019, then I decided to come back and then I did and a pandemic took place. So it was it was a totally different environment and I cannot imagine what will happen to me is I, if, I, if I'm in KL during the pandemic. And then, uh, you know, the, the, the growth of um, interest towards plants and, and, and taking care of nature. And then it was in Rumah Gahara where John went in and then Katie went in and Reese went in. Um, it was just magical. I couldn't thank myself or I, I couldn't thank the universe and God enough of what had happened to me. And then it went into a direction that I think it, it soothes me a lot. And then I know I will be able to, to do creation of, to be more creative towards my arts. And Ruz Gahara will be coming in into a new dimension. And, and of course it will take time, but we don't want to, you know, I mean, yes, art is sustainable when it comes to commercialization, but we have to know the balance between both. Yeah. Just as I simple agree. as yoga, how do you create balance in it? And then what makes it more interesting is that we are actually uh, putting in a, a lot more elements towards that, spiritual elements, yes. um, uh, um, you know, about the metaphysics and everything. Yeah. So so I, I think the best I mean, one of the main elements to teach in the education towards the, you know, early group of people or youngsters is that, and of course, their parents, is to, to not ne neglect on the importance of art in the education, in the career yeah. and whatnot. Yes. I was trained as an architect, and then I choose not to be in architecture. And of, not to say that architecture is bad, but it's not always about being a lawyer or a loser. We have to change that mindset. So these are the things that maybe MCC has to take charge. And of course, with the help and support from people like John and, and somebody who are already up there. And then, of course, uh, the parents will consider this group of people are very successful. But you need to know that it's not always about being an engineer. Then you are a successful person. Yeah. So we have to, to, to keep on changing it and then try to create a new um perspective to people to parents to 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 send their students uh, sorry to send their children to dance classes to send their students to learn art and of course to be more important is that to get the system of education in malaysia to be reapplying back uh kalasini, the you know the art um subjects and everything and then make that yeah. as one of the main uh as a core subjects or, or core well in university. As what John has said, uh, um, it's going to take a long time for the government to do. And that's one why one of the reasons I didn't stay with government and I just started my own school. 
No, 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 Katie, don't tell it too much. <laughs> no, what I mean is, I mean, it takes, we work closely with the government, yes. Correct. At the same time, it is really up to us, like what John has said, um, up to us, all of us, you know, to really, and that's why I, um, like I proposed um, with you, we really need to go into the education and we can start, um, you know, like what John said, that's what we've been planning actually to start with my school with a small group of students that we have, that we really need that because my school is um, about, it's a memorization, Quran memorization school in English medium. So mm -hmm. it's really, we really need to be mindful, um, John, we really need to watch their food. They really need to be, you know, be present. And well, oh, can yeah. I um, so uh, important. Yeah. make a suggestion that, hmm. you know, yeah. the word art sometimes can be threatening to some people. Mm -hmm. Or intimidate, not threatening, but intimidating, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Because they feel they're not artistic or things like that. But maybe as uh, to introduce people into this artistic realm, we can say we change the word art to life. Okay. You have to know how to live life. Yeah. Okay. For example, when you eat, you chew slowly and then try to taste the different textures of your food mm -hmm. so ask your kid how many textures can you decipher in the nasi that you eat mm -hmm. yeah. so is it smooth is it smudgy is it pasty and then 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 suddenly when they have to decide their mind get exposed to the the concept of texture before they never yes, yes. eat the rice they don't think about texture right so as they are thinking about the texture, they're actually digesting their rice in the right way. Yes. And it's a beautiful feeling when you digest it properly because you don't get indigestion, right? So you eat your food properly and then you open your mind up to the concept of textures. Yeah. That's, is that art? Of course that's of art. Of course it's art. But you tell them that's life. You have to chew your food properly in order to enjoy your food and enjoying your food is part of life, right? Yeah. If you drink... I mean, Muslims don't drink wine, but for people who drink wine, it's the same thing, you know, or you, or you, or you drink, let's say in Taiwan is tea, right? When we drink tea, they have very gentle Zen music in the background. They have to arrange their floral arrangement in the right way. It's like tea, Japanese tea ceremony. And then when they drink the tea, right, they have to decipher whether the tea slips down your throat or it rolls down your throat. Yeah. Who ever thought of that slipping down and rolling down? There's a difference, but we... It's so subtle, we, we, we seldom indulge in that subtle, subtlety, but indulging in that subtlety is actually art because when you paint, right, a flower, you will want to know whether the gradation, you know, from, from white to pink, how much red you're going to, you, you have to decide how much color you're going to add, the subtlety of color. And, and, and so when you introduce the art of living, mm, 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 mm. then you'll see, you know, when you arrange your, 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 what you call it? <laughs> uh, sambal kangkong, right? It's all green. Yeah. Maybe you should put big pieces of garlic to put on some white to exactly. lighten up the green, right? Yeah. Yeah. Then, then that's yeah. art already. You know, you're thinking of designing the food so it looks more appetizing, right? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. like, um, like when I cook the asam pedas, right? I'll put my, the, you know, the lady's fingers, the, the, I will, I, you know, I won't make it too, too overcooked because it will turn brown. So I purposely make it slightly green, just steam mm -hmm. it lightly and mm -hmm. put it on top of the asam pedas. So the red and the green will contrast, right? Yeah. So that's yeah. hard. But how many people think like that? A lot of the food is so tasty, but it's all brown, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, like, yeah. yeah, so when I went to Kelantan, I was so happy that all the machit decided to do that. You know, when they even their colorful desserts, they, put, they don't put red, red, red. They mix the red and then the green and then the yellow and then the red again. So yeah. like, like, like the, the textile behind me. Yeah. Like, see how the colors are evenly distributed. Yeah. So the whole textile is like a bunga kahidupan, right? Yeah. So it's alive, right? And you know, this is a very difficult technique because it's applique. So you have to actually yeah. stitch one by one. And by stitching one by one, the whole piece will become static. And yet they manage to keep the curve so alive so that you have the dynamic burst of energy coming out from the central flower. There you so go. This is, wow. the, this is the rhythm that Nick is talking about when he goes to Kelantan, he sees his plants, you know, like 
you show me the creeper, right? Mm. It, it's all around. Like, you know, when I, I had this um, Japanese yam. Yeah. You no. Know, in, in, in Japan, it's an aphrodisiac because it's so powerful. Powerful, So the Japanese wives would love to buy the yam for their husbands oh. <laughs> to make their husbands alive. But I didn't know how powerful these yams were because I had a yam. I wanted to make a dish, but I realized that night I was so busy. I was packing to go to, I was going on a trip. So I was going to Singapore, right? So I left the yam in my kitchen in Taipei oh. and I, I, I traveled for three weeks. When I came back, my kitchen was a forest. Wow. The yam started to sprout and it was all over my kitchen and all over my, my dishes. And it was so smart. It knew where to where not to go and where to go. It's like the, the yam leaves had, had, had eyes. So it was like this. It just full of life and energy. And I really didn't want to destroy it because it was a beautiful sight, right? So I hope people will understand this soul and kahidupan life uh, and the art of living, right? Mm. So, so much so that, you know, when you choose your glasses, you know, how they match your color, when you choose, you know, your tooth filling, what, what kind of filling you get, when you choose your handbag, how it matches your skin color, everything is according to the rhythms of nature because I think God didn't create this world in an anyhow attitude, right? He yeah. decided where to put what, yeah. you know? Otherwise, how do we get such beautiful butterflies and caterpillars, right? Yeah. Yeah. How do yeah. we get such beautiful sea creatures? Look at the shells that I collect. All the patterns are actually patterns of our, our, our kind, you know? The batik patterns could actually copy the patterns of the shell yeah. because it's like a message from God. This is the patterns that, that have soul and rhythm, yeah. you know? And, and that's why the concept of fractals, you know fractals, right? Yeah. Like in the um, um, uh, Paku uh, Pakis, the down Pakis, right? Mm -hmm. When you have a pattern in the front, it, nature will let it create itself. Like fractals is like a standard natural pattern that will recreate itself, right? Yeah. It's a, a pattern of life. Yeah. So that that's a gift from nature that we should be inspired by. Oh my God. Beautiful. That's amazing. That's amazing. I, oh my God. I, I, I have a lot of things to, to summarize, but I think that's... Go ahead. <laughs> that, that, that summarizes it. Uh, but Nick, one no, more no, thing. Yeah. It can, can be summarized. That what, what is very interesting to note is uh, the fact that John used colorful words. Yeah. Uh, so again, our viewers are, 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 are intelligent Yes, to listen to John's yeah. conversation and then uh, the sharing. We, of course, our topic is about the importance of knowing and honoring your heritage. But see, where we go now from heritage, we go into the mindfulness, we go into religion, and of course, the history itself. And then um, I like to, to uh, when, when John was mentioning about putting it in, in a different perspective, you know, because yeah. people are afraid of art, even though it's, yeah. it can be just a very simple word, art. Yeah. But... You know, the layers yeah, the, of perspective yeah. of art is so huge that John yes, wants yes. to put it into life. Is something yeah. just next to us or it's just in us. And then I guess that um, to summarize on this conversation and then a very nice um, topic that John was mentioning is looking at, at a simpler thing. We yeah. don't want to be too bombastic and then using a very, very uh, intricate language. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. method of life and, and maybe making our our life more complicated which led into something a bit more confusing to ourselves just like looking yeah. at simpler thing simpler thing and then looking at the plant for example you just know that it's going to happen and then you you know your the destiny is there you know the fate is there and then that is you know me being a, a, a Muslim I believe that you know God has a better plan for you all you yeah. have to do is just to go with you the just flow. flow. Yeah, yes. just follow it. Just, just follow the rhythm. And then, of course, the rhythm of nature is the best. Yeah. Katie, yeah. I have no words to say. I, I just thought of a fantastic summary. In, oh. in, in one capsule, the summary is Kelantan. Oh. <laughs> yes. When I went to Kelantan, when we were eating the fantastic food that was so beautifully arranged at your house, yeah. You know, everything was beautiful, the banana leaf and all that, the colors were fantastic. You had music. 
and you had singing. Yeah. So it all comes together. You know, that's life. How can you have life without dancing and singing and 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 food, and then art, right? So we had our batik shirts on. We were eating our food. We we're listening to the the songs. So all that is the summary. We've lost it a lot of it in KL. Yeah, yeah. I'm so yes, happy yes. to see that in Kelantan. Yeah, where people are actually living, yeah. right? Yes, it's, it's it's just sad that the street lights you don't have enough of. You know, the yeah. roads are still in 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 bad condition. That re- this uh you know it needs repair, but the people are living. Yeah. You yes. know, when I went to um uh Singora, you know, also the same. They had yeah. the music, they had the silat, even, you know, where you wash your hands, they had a beautiful floral arrangement. Yeah. It's like line. life is art and art is life. It's integrated. Yes. Everything yeah. has a soul. So I, I'm not sure about the other states because I haven't seen that situation. I haven't, you know, my goal in, in living in Malaysia is to, you know, stay a, a month or so in every state, right? Yeah. So I, I hope that in other states I can have the same experience because when you go to Indonesia, right, in the small villages, when it comes to dance, the traditional dance, everybody yang and old knows the steps. Yeah. My God, I'm saying, how do they, they kept the culture. They all know how to sing the same songs. You yeah. know, and the songs are from their grandparents or their great grandparents. Yeah. And the dance steps are the traditional Javanese dance steps. Nowadays, you ask some of the Malay people, you know, how to, to jog it or how to zap in, they forget. They know about it, but they don't know how to do it, right? Yeah. It should be in our blood and in our rhythm. We should already know it, right? Mm-hmm. So I saw that in yeah. Kelantan. So that's the summary. Let's make Kelantan, you know, as a, a symbol of our Kehidupan. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, sure, so I'm sure John said that not because I am Clantonese and not because he just got back from Clanton, but it's good motivation for us in MCC yeah. to keep doing what we are doing and then to keep making things that can actually relate back to our history and culture. So yeah. Katie, back to you. We have like two minutes left. <laughs> exactly. So thank you so much, um, John, for um, becoming our guest tonight. It's such a beautiful, insightful sharing. Um, as always, I'm always inspired by your sharing. Always, I love your colorful words. I love yeah. the choices of um, adjectives that you use. And I think that's also another area we should explore. And if I use maybe with John oh, yeah. again, you know, the link, because you mentioned about texture, you know, to decipher that requires language. And perhaps right. how that has influenced other textiles and our, our heritage too. If yeah. I can have like one line that. of when 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 John, when Katie was mentioning, okay, let's have John to be our panel. For tonight, <laughs> like, are you sure we are not in like a serious conversation or something? <laughs> no, are, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going so going John for so long, and then I want to put John into like you know a special. If if we are having him as a panel, it has to be like a very prestigious stage or something. But, <laughs> Golden Exchange Shower is just about the sharing, but thank you so much thank you for so your much, willingness John. to be thank part you. of us. And and we, I mean, we, by by having the people like you to be supporting yeah. us, it makes us even stronger and more motivated to keep doing what we do. Yes, yes please do that. Yes. <laughs> yep. So thank you again. Thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts, um, John. Thank, thank you for you that so beautiful sharing as well during the luncheon on Wednesday that opened yes. up my eyes and um, give life to tonight's um, Golden Exchange Hour. All right. So for those audience out there, thank you for um, showing up as well. Thank you for watching tonight. I believe you've learned a lot. Like I've mentioned earlier, if you're not a fan um, and you haven't fallen in love yet, you've definitely will. You'll definitely be converted once you, yeah. you know, attended one of John's sessions, right? <laughs> so I, I always, you know, I've always been. Yeah. So it's yes, great. I yeah. think we're just nice on time. Any um, last word, John? Any one final golden touch? Yes. I think every one of us should live it up. <laughs> <laughs> cool. That's it. Yeah. That summarizes it all. Just nice. Right on time at 10. Thank you so much, everyone. Make sure you go, uh, make sure you watch us again next week. Follow us on Malaysian Craft Council um, on FB and also follow us on IG. And next week we will have the Malay session. Okay. Yes. Great personalities again. All right. Goodbye and good night. Have a lovely, lovely week ahead. <laughs> Bye bye. Okay, bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. John, don't leave yet. Okay. <laughs>
Did you think it was going to be a serious textile talk? <laughs> oh, I already told John. Chill, chill. No.